Welcome everybody to this Atmospheric Sciences webinar here at AGU. My name is Rob Rader. Uh, forgive the background, as most of you, I am uh, working at home teleworking. Uh, AGU staff mandatory telework took took effect last week. So we are coming to you live from my basement. Um, uh, so this webinar is a the fourth in a series of webinars from the Atmospheric Sciences section. Uh, it is based on a session at our fall meeting in 2019 uh, from the past into the future which was a series of invited talks put together by the atmospheric sciences section in celebration of the agu centennial so just a couple of things to talk about really quick uh, here are our presenters uh, they will be talking to you also remotely so we will go ahead and switch over to sue in a moment but before we do just to let you know this webinar will be recorded so if you have to miss any of it or if you'd like to share this with your colleagues you're welcome to do that we will have the webinars posted to uh, agu's webinar website as well as atmospheric sciences website so you'll be able to access that afterwards i did put into the chat um, area the uh, links to the abstracts for both of these talks from Susan and Sonia so you can take a look at those while the speakers are, are, are talking and so without further ado you don't want to hear from me you're here to hear from our speakers so I will go ahead and switch over to Susan Vandenhever um, gonna go ahead and make you the presenter Sue Great. all right thanks for being here appreciate it can you see everything all right there, Rob? Looks good to me. Okay, great. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today again as we once again get set to celebrate the AGU Centennial. And firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this great celebration, and it's certainly a great honor to be included along with the other speakers in this series. Okay, so today I'm gonna to be speaking about past achievements as well as future challenges, in our understanding, observing, and modeling of convective storm processes. And so let's start out then, what are deep convective storms? Well, these are really cloud systems that are driven primarily by buoyancy and vertical pressure gradients. They include all sorts of phases of water from water vapor through liquid and ice processes. They are found in continental and maritime regions, as well as in the mid-latitudes and in the tropics. And as you can see from this image here, they take on a wide range of morphologies and organization, which dictates or helps in part determine their longevity, as well as their intensity and the kinds of weather that they produce. All right, so shown here, um, deep convective storms, they have a wide range of different features and processes, such as shown by this cross-section through such a storm system. And as you can see from here, Air rises in through the updrafts and sinks through the downdrafts. And upon rising up in through the updrafts, it spreads out and forms these umbrella-shaped clouds at the top, referred to as anvil clouds. And similarly, air sinking in the downdrafts also spreads out upon reaching the surface and produces what we refer to as cold pools. And cold pools are really important in terms of sustaining the current parent storm, as well as in initiating new convection. Also, as I said on the previous slide, Deep convective storms have a number of different phases of water included in them. Uh, let me just move that over. There we go. Um, and they also have a large range of processes, microphysical processes on the go from droplet nucleation and growth all the way through to similar processes for ice crystals. And of course, these processes then end up quite often producing precipitation at the surface. And then, as I said, by virtue of these different phases involved in deep convective storms, we see a lot of latent heating and cooling on the go, which then talks to interactions with the dynamics of these storm systems. So why then study deep convective storms? Well, first and foremost, they are, are producers of fresh water, and in some regions of the waters, so they're the only producers of fresh water. Also, they play a really important role in the vertical mixing and transport of different um, elements of the air, including energy, momentum, water vapor, aerosols, trace gases. And by virtue of that vertical transport, they play a fundamental role in the large scale circulation as shown in this schematic where you can see deep convector contributions to the Hadley cell circulation. Also by virtue of the production of these large anvils at storm tops, they play an important role in cloud radiator forcing. 
And then finally, they also um, primary contributors to the production of severe weather, everything from tornadoes through to large hail. And so there really are many reason, reasons why we should care about these convective storms. All right, so in terms of um, some of the fundamental challenges that we face throughout the ages in trying to understand these storm systems, First and foremost, the, one of the issues that we face is the tremendous range of spatial scales involved. So if we look at a cumulus cloud like this, which we could assume to have a spatial scale on order of one kilometer, and then we focus on the little um, aerosol particles or cloud condensation nuclei on which we need to grow cloud droplets. These guys live on the order of about 0.1 microns. Then this actually represents a spatial scale that's on about 10 orders of magnitude. This is a tremendous spatial scale, and I was trying to work out ways in which to get our head around um, understanding such a spatial scale. And so I thought, well, if you can equate the cumulus cloud, um, the spatial scale is there to say that of the, or the orbit of the moon around the Earth, then in terms of an equivalent scale for the aerosols in the system, these would be the size of oak leaves. And so hopefully this gives you some sense of really the extraordinary scales involved when we're trying to understand deep convective storm processes. Right, so that was the first reason, these tremendous spatial scales. The second reason is really the complex processes that are involved with deep convective storms. If you look at this image here, there are a lot of um, sort of multiple microphysical pathways that can be followed in order to produce some of these different um, ice hydrometers, such as grassel and hail. And then in addition to these multiple complex pathways, there's also a lot of feedbacks between the precipitation processes and the cloud dynamics that make studying these storms more challenging. So, as I said, there's a wide range of temporal and spatial scales involved with deep convective storms. There's also a large number of different processes involved. And then often with the interactions with the microphysical processes and the dynamical processes, these feedbacks are often very nonlinear in characteristic and so that adds to the challenge as well, of course, the fun to studying deep convection. Okay, so this is supposed to be the centennial celebration of the AGU. And so I want to look now at past accomplishments that we've seen in storm studies over the last 10 decades. And I'm going to do 10 decades and 10 slides, so hang on for the ride. So firstly, let's start out in the 1890s. And I want you to note, I'm gonna use these little icons here at the top. Um, of women's clothing to give us some sense of what the decades were like at the time when these studies were being conducted. So first and foremost, as I said, starting out in the 1890s, it was during this decade that Aitken developed his dust counter, and this allowed us to count the number of particles or cloud condensation nuclei on which cloud droplets could grow. Uh, this was really important because it allowed us to assess or understand global distributions of cloud condensation nuclei in terms of how they varied from region to region, including from city to more rural regions, as well as over continents and maritime regions, where we know that in cities and continents, we see that the number concentrations of these nuclei are a lot higher than they are over their um, corresponding um, uh, more rural and maritime regions. So an important discovery. Then we skip forward about three decades into the 1930s. This was the decade in which women were wearing long evening gowns. And it was during this time that Kohler put forward his theory for equilibrium hygroscopic growth and droplet activation, the results of which are summarized in the schematic here. These were important findings because um, these showed us the importance of aerosol size and composition in terms of when they would nucleate at specific supersaturations. Also during this decade, Bergeron and Finn Dyson were studying mixed phase clouds and they noted the um, growth of ice crystals, the preferential growth of ice crystals at the expense of liquid water within these systems. This was important because we could see liquid crystals growing um, by virtue of taking the liquid water from these drops they could grow to sizes that were large enough to fall and collect other crystals on their way down. And this taught us a lot about ice uh, microphysical processes, how we generate ice precipitation at the surface, all of which have been important by virtue of, of ice precipitation processes, both within the tropics and within the mid-latitudes. 
right into the 1940s. During this decade, women were wearing boiler suits in representation of their contributions to the Second World War effort. During this decade, the Thunderstorm Project was conducted, and this was the first large-scale multi-agency project mandated and funded by Congress. The goal of this project was to investigate the internal structure of thunderstorms, particularly the degree of turbulence, as well as focusing on the development, maintenance, and magnitude of downdraft, with the ultimate goal then of actually to establish appropriate methods by which thunderstorms could be better forecast. This was a remarkable project in its own right, perhaps made all the more remarkable by the fact that forecasters in the, in the field only had access to hand-drawn weather maps as well as vertical profiles from the radio songs being launched. Um, you can see in this image here that five different planes were involved in the field campaign. They flew at five different levels, and they also had radio songs and radars involved. And the objective really, as noted by Roscoe Brown, who was one of the leaders um, of the field campaign, he noted this a number of years later, the objective was really to maintain or obtain the maximum number of traverses through each storm and to sample storms in all stages of development. And he goes on to say no storm was to be avoided because it appeared too large or too violent. Truly famous last words for those of us who are involved in field campaigns focusing on deep convective storms. Uh, during the field campaign, 179 storms were sampled, lightning struck the plane 21 times, and hail left in, uh, dense in the fuselages and wings on the order of two to three inches in diameter. There were a number of major findings arose from this field campaign. First and foremost, the model of thunderstorms, which is still used to this day, was developed. In this model, um, the field campaign participants noted that during the initial stages, updrafts were predominant. Then as you got into the mature stage, which the schematic represents here, both updrafts and downdrafts were playing a role, as you can see here. And then in the decaying stages of, of deep convective storms, the downdrafts were predominant. They also noted that the tilt and movement of deep convective storms were related to the vertical wind shear within the environment, that the diurnal cycle played a really important role in determining some of the characteristics of these storm systems, and they were also actually able to link radar data to surface rainfall precipitation rates. So truly a remarkable field campaign and, a, and great advancements were made to our understanding of deep convective storms as a result. All right, we now move into 1950s and the decade of swinging skirts. And based on the knowledge that liquid water drops freeze homogeneously at about minus 38 degrees C, Researchers like Mason and Schaefer noted the need for ice nucleating particles in order to um, nucleate ice crystals in regions where the temperatures were warmer than minus 38 degrees C. Also, the growth of cloud droplets and ice crystals by vapor diffusion became better understood. And then coalescence in which drops um, um, joined together following collisions was found to be a very important process in terms of making drops large enough to fall to the surface of precipitation within the lifetimes or life cycles afforded by um, convective clouds. Raindrop size distributions were also measured using different techniques of radar. And then finally, in this decade, there was a, a lot of recognition and a lot of emphasis placed on the coupling of cloud dynamics and microphysics. Into the 1960s we roll, the decade of baby doll dresses. Right, this we saw the launch of the first weather satellites, which gave us unprecedented views of the global distributions of different cloud types. We, it was also seen during this decade that ice crystal habits or shape varied as a function of temperature. And then there were a lot of studies during this decade too on the collision and breakup of cloud droplets and their impacts on warm rain processes. Finally, there was a renewed interest in this decade on the dynamics of squall lines. Okay, the 1970s, the decade of bell buttons and jeans. It was during this decade that GATE was held. This was a remarkable international effort. 72 nations were involved. For those of you that tuned in last week, Ed Zipsa spoke about this effort, and so I'm not going to focus on that anymore here today. However, what we did see was the increased utilization of Doppler radar in assisting us in our real-time detection of mesoscale features and severe weather, um, such as, and severe weather, excuse me, and severe storms, 
we could detect, for example, the rotation within, within severe storms using Doppler radar. Developing in parallel to the utilization of Doppler radar was the development of three-dimensional numerical models of clouds. And for the first time, this allowed us to interrogate these cloud systems, at least in virtual space, in terms of their flow regimes, rotation, and so on. And also then during this decade was an um, enhanced focus on secondary ice processes through rhyme splintering. This was important to enhance our understanding of new sites of ice nucleation. Ten years later, the decade of leather jackets. During this decade, we saw an enhanced understanding of tornadic thunderstorm dynamics. This was achieved primarily through the use of numerical modeling. We also saw an enhanced um, focus on airborne measurements of the structure and airflow within hurricane, st hurricane storm systems. And then mesoscale convector complexes are shown in this animation down here, these large circular systems. They were recognized as distinct weather systems with their own set of dynamics and uh, kinematical flow regimes. Okay, the 1990s, right? The decade of, of plaid matching jackets and skirts. We see the first temps that actually simulating, at least in a prognostic manner, rainfall and snowfall within numerical models. Up until this time, the focus had really only been on cloud water and cloud ice, and modelers were now interested in capturing or representing those processes of the development of snow and rain and as it fell to the surface. There was also a growing interest during this decade in aerosol air indirect and direct effects. Into the 2000s, the decade of tracksuits. In this decade, we see the first cl cloud radar in space in terms of cloud sets. And we also see the first constellation of satellites aimed at really coordinating measurements of cloud processes in the A train. It was also during this decade that we see interest developing in the convective invigoration of cloud systems by the presence of aerosols. And then finally, into the 2010s, right, our current decade, the decade of big sneakers. This was, uh, during this decade, we really see the first measurements of aerosol and cloud properties from drones or UAV platforms. We also see the use of the first global convection and tropical cyclone permitting simulations. And then once again, we now see this renewed interest in terms of the coupling and the feedback between the microphysical processes and the dynamical processes within deep storms. Okay, so I'm sure you agree, this has been a remarkable 100 years in terms of the development and enhancement of our knowledge of storm systems. However, there's still, we still have a long way to go. And so I'd like to spend the next or the remaining part of my talk now focusing on four primary current unknowns, what I certainly feel are four primary current unknowns, as well as the challenges that we may face as we move into the future and we are trying to address these issues. And so the first of these unknowns or the first of these elements that I feel we need to focus on are updrafts and downdrafts. And so there's a lot of unknowns or a lot of questions we can ask about updrafts and downdrafts. Firstly, how are they impacted by microphysical processes and the feedback between the microphysics and the dynamics? Secondly, what is the role of the environment of the environment and various environmental properties. For example, we still do not have a unified theory that, that um, teaches us about how environmental properties and updraft dynamics are integrally linked. And then also, what is the role of entrainment in terms of determining updraft and downdraft characteristics? Other questions we might ask, for example, what is the relationship between updrafts and anvils? Does a stronger updraft necessarily mean that we have to have deeper anvils, thicker anvils? or both. So there's a lot that we are asking in this regard. In terms of some of the challenges then we might face in trying to address some of those questions about updrafts and downdrafts, let's first look at what we might um, run into in terms of the modeling community. Firstly, um, we know right now that high resolution cloud resolving models, for example, tend to over predict uh, updraft vertical velocities, at least when compared with Doppler derived estimates. Um, of these same velocities. We've also seen great sensitivity to updraft velocities as a function of the initial conditions shown here in gray and the microphysical parameterizations shown here in black. And then we also know that there's great sensitivity in our simulations to model grid spacing. You can see from these cross sections through a score line system here, 
course a resolution on the top, final resolution on the bottom. We can note from here that the final resolution simulations are able to capture more of the updraft intensities, more of the structures of the updraft. So a lot of challenges in terms of the modeling side of things, but there are also challenges in terms of the observations. What we really need to address some of these issues with updraft and downdraft are co-located data sets on a global basis of updraft velocities as well as co-located microphysical characteristics. Now we get a lot of that, a lot of the information about the microphysics already from space-based radars like CloudSat, an example of which is shown here, as well as other um, platforms such as GPM. Of course, one of the shortfalls in these platforms is, um, or one of the limitations is their temporal sampling. You may argue that geostationary platforms give us better temporal sampling, and they certainly do, but they don't allow us to see the vertical structure or to take vertical profiles through these storm systems. And it's really important to note that there are currently no space-based observations of updraft and downdraft velocities. Certainly, EarthCare is projected to be launched in 2022. This will give us Doppler velocities, although it's not clear as to how much information will be, will be um, obtained within deep convective cores. There's lots of ideas being considered by numerous groups right now, including putting small sets or cube sets into different or multiple orbital planes. These kinds of approaches would allow us to address the diurnal cycle of precipitation, for example. And others are considering putting small sets or cube sets in the same plane, separated by different time intervals, thereby allowing us to examine or look into the evolution of, of storm systems at the kind of temporal scales that these storms develop at. Um, in placing things like uh, miniature radars and miniature radiometers on these CubeSats, we would be able to obtain, for example, unprecedented views, three-dimensional views, into deep convective storms, as shown by this animation here. And it should be noted that the um, NASA's HCCP study framework is currently looking into a lot of these different possibilities to enhance our views and our understanding of storm systems as we move into the next decade. All right, so that was updrafts and downdrafts. What's the next thing that I think are one of our big challenges? And that's ice processes. And so a lot of the questions or the kinds of questions we may ask pertaining to ice processes include how are hailstorms and hailstones changing in changing climate? What determines some of these predominant pathways in forming these different kinds of hydromedia species? And how many ice crystals are produced in secondary ice production events? We may be orders of magnitude off still in addressing this question. And then finally, how do things like collection efficiencies vary as a function of ice crystal shape? There are lots of challenges in going after enhancing our understanding of ice processes and their roles in deep convection. And in fact, I regard this as one of the primary challenges facing modelers, whether you model in high resolution LES frameworks all the way through into global cloud models. Questions that we still do not understand is really how would we represent the following in models? How do we go after the multiple pathways, for example, of ice formation? How do we take into account the fact that the density of ice crystals can vary from 0.2 to 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter, which is really an order of magnitude, and yet we have to specify these things a priori or before running our model simulations. What are the roles of crystal habits and, and shape and how do we represent these within our models? And then also how do we go out to collection efficiencies, aggregation rates, and the best ways in which to represent secondary ice production. These are certainly challenging issues, but they are hampered further by the fact that we really do not have appropriate observations right now with which to evaluate these processes. And obtaining such observations is certainly a very difficult task for sure. Okay, the third thing that I think we need to go after is the role played by the environment. And so questions that we might ask in this regard are why do the most intense storms form where they do on the earth? In this study by Zitzer and colleagues, they noted very intense storms within equatorial Africa, such similar intense storms do not exist in equatorial America, and yet in spite of the fact that these um, atmospheric conditions are relatively similar, why is that the case? What kinds of updraft velocities 
and the profiles of these updraft velocities support different kinds of severe weather. We do not know the answer to that question as yet. And also we do not know things, for example, like what environments support tornado genesis. We know basic important characteristics like the shear plays a role, the lifting condensation plays a role, but we don't know which factors are predominant or what combination of factors are really important as demonstrated by the mix of gray and black dots here representing tornadic and non-tornadic storm systems. And if we're gonna address some of these issues within our models, we're certainly gonna need a high frequency of temporal and spatial observations. This in itself is challenging whether or not this is, these observations are taken from space and or ground platforms. And then the last thing I think that's really important in terms of um, enhancing our understanding of deep convective storms is the role of cold pools. This image shows a beautiful cold pool developing here. It's from the International Space Station, this image. You can see the cold pool moving out away from its dissipating parent storm, lofting lots of dust, and then generating new cloud developments in and along its edge or in and along its gust front. What we don't know, for example, are what are the impacts of land surface processes, aerosols, sea surface temperatures, relative humidity, and so on, on cold pools and their intensity and propagation speeds. We also don't yet have a good understanding of the spatial and temporal scales that are important to cold pools. And while we know that cold pools, as you can see from this animation, which is a plan view from above a series of different storms, while we know the cold pools are important in the initiation of convection in and along the edges of cold pools, we do not fully understand the relationship between cold pools and convective initiation. For example, how many storms would actually go up along any specific gust front on, on any specific day? We also know that cold pools are playing an important role in convective organization. But once again, we don't fully understand that relationship. These images here on the right are from a modeling simulation in which in the top cold pools have been included, in the bottom cold pools have been removed. And you can see that the, the organization of the convective morphology differs greatly depending on the presence or absence of cold pools. Finally, given the importance of cold pools and the role they play in convective initiation and organization, these effects really need to be included in GCM. And so there's been a lot of recent interest in the development of cold pool parameterization in order to take these into account. Some of the challenges if we're gonna go after cold pools, certainly in terms of the modeling world, grid spacing is challenging. These two images are of a cross section of a cold pool advancing in this direction. The grid spacing in the top here is 50 meters and the bottom is 400 meters. And you can see great differences as a function of grid spacing in terms of the structures of these cold pools. This, is, this plays a really important role in cold pool processes such as dissipation. The land surface also plays a really important role because cold pools flow or, or um, spread out across the land surface. And so the way in which we represent our land surfaces is critical to cold pool representation within numerical models. This image here shows um, simulations of the same cold pool, in this case with an interactive land surface boundary, in this case, a non-interactive uh, land surface boundary. These are half mile of plots, time moving from bottom to top. And you can see that as a function of the uh, land surface interactions represented, so the intensity, the extent, and the rate at which these cold pools propagate is really highly impacted. We also know that the microphysics plays a role in cold pools. For example, drop size distributions will impact evaporation rates. And by virtue of the manner in which, um, or let me say like this, land surface processes and microphysical parameterizations are some of the things we most, uh, we find most challenging to represent our models right now. And so this of course is then gonna have impact for the way in which we simulate or represent our cold pools. From an observational point of view on cold pools, these, are, these, are, these animals live very near the surface. They are typically, although not always, very shallow features. And sometimes the temperature differences within the cold pool compared to its surroundings are really quite small. Also, cold pools are comprised of clear air. And so all of these things make these animals very difficult to go after, be it from space or even from ground-based measurements such as ground-based radar. All right, so I've now come to the end of my talk. And so let me summarize um, the, the points that I put forward to you today. Firstly, I hope I've managed to convince you that over the last 100 years, we've seen um, progressive but really remarkable development 
in our understanding of deep convective storm processes. Secondly, I would argue, perhaps somewhat contentiously, that we are currently observationally limited. Our current models can certainly simulate using high temporal and spatial resolutions. We can simulate all sorts of processes. However, um, given, our, given the difficulties in collecting appropriate observational databases to allow us to evaluate various microphysical parameters and processes, advancing our models right now is certainly challenging. Furthermore, if we consider the development of global cloud resolving models, we're going to need to have measurements or observations of these processes on, within global databases, right? We need these observations made um, on the scales of the globe. And then I discussed four, what I believe are four primary challenges facing us if we want to enhance our understanding um, of deep convective storms. We looked at updrafts and downdrafts, we looked at ice processes, we looked at the role of the environment, and we looked at the role of cold pools. Are there others? Yeah, there are lots of others for sure. There's the role of the Rhino cycle, for example, and the role that aerosols play. But you guys only gave me 30 minutes, and so I couldn't cover these. And with that, I will stop there. Thanks very much for your attention today. Thank you so much, Sue, for that. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in. Uh, remember, you've got that raise hand functionality that you're welcome to use so that we can actually unmute you and you can ask your question on your mic or your phone. Uh, but we do have a few questions here in the questions chat box. So uh, from Ed, is if it is true that entity and entrainment into updrafts is inversely proportional to diameter. What fundamentally determines updraft diameter? <laughs> Ed, I think we should be asking you that question, right? <laughs> and I think this follows on from some of our, our recent discussions. I, yeah, I'm not sure we have a full understanding of that. I think that's one of the things that we really need to go after. And um, I think a lot of work needs to be done on that. It's certainly challenging to address that within our numerical models right now by virtue of the scales um, that entrainment you know, is captured on. We rely, some ways we can, we can capture it accurately in other ways, you know, as the scales get smaller and smaller, we need to rely on parameterizations and we know there's shortfalls in that. So I think it's a challenging scenario. I think we've got a long way to addressing that in models and addressing it in observations, I think is very difficult. So in short, yeah, I'm not sure actually what fully determines that and I, Yes, you know, that's work to come still. Thank you, Ed. Uh, from Yutong, uh, what is our current level of understanding of the land-ocean contrast in convective intensity? Have we found the reason why the most intense convective events happen over land, although the CAPE is similar between land and ocean? Capital C-A-P-E. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this seems to be the sort of similar answer I gave to Ed. So, Yes, we understand over land that um, storms appear to be more intense for a variety of different processes, including the heating of the land surface that happens more rapidly. And hence, we are able to um, generate buoyancy and overcome sin more rapidly over land. But again, these are some of the questions that we ask over land and over ocean. And Ed Zips's paper, that 2006 paper that I show here, raises, raises some of those questions in terms of the fact that we've got a long way to go in understanding the role of the environment and what it plays. Um, so no, again, the short answer to that is yes, we have some sense of the understanding of that, but over the oceans, we've got a lot more work to do. I think that's why we're seeing a lot of field campaigns being conducted over oceans to understand the role of that um, interface, that, that ocean atmospheric interface the role that it plays in convective intensity. Uh, CAMPEX, for example, was held just last year to go after understanding some of those some of those issues. All right, uh, let's get one more question. There's a couple of other questions. We'll be sure to share these with you, Sue, offline so that you can respond. Uh, but here's the final question. What is the current status on the cold pool present representation in the global and regional climate models from Rakesh? Yeah, so there's been, uh, um, quite a lot of recent development, which is very exciting in terms of developing cold pool parameterizations. Um, there's still quite a lot of work to go in that regard. And I think the important thing here to remember is that we can only parameterize what we really understand. 
And so some of those questions, questions that I raised in talking about coal pools in that section, for example, we don't still, we don't fully understand actually, you know, how often convection is initiated along coal pools and how that may be determined by the local environment. So some of those elements are actually very difficult to incorporate in coal pool parameterization, but they're necessary if we're going to represent these processes correctly in GCM. So I think we've seen great starts in developing um, coal pool parameterizations for, for GCMs, but that progress is somewhat inhibited by the fact that you know, our understanding is not fully developed in this regard. All right, with that, thank you so much for your presentation, Sue. Appreciate it. We are going to go ahead and switch over to Sonia now. Again, there are a couple of questions that did not get uh, get to Sue, so I'll make sure that they get to Sue offline. Okay, Sonia, welcome. Going to go ahead and make you the presenter. So you're welcome to share your slides when you're ready. Thanks for being here. Thank you, uh, Rob, uh, and thanks uh, to uh, Jim and Paul for the invitation to this session. Uh, so it's uh, late uh, in the day here in Switzerland, uh, and I'm uh, calling from uh, home. I think many people are also in lockdown, so uh, thoughts to everybody. Uh, so I will talk about weather and climate extremes. Um, I've done very few uh, modifications compared to December, some few updates also based on more recent uh, findings and uh, maybe also one slide on the COVID-19 crisis. So I also included as quarters uh, Xubin Zhang, Lisa Alexander um, and Gabby Egel, who are all the co-chairs of the WCRP Grand Challenge on Extremes uh, together with me. And so I will focus a bit more on the aspects related to processes, but also wanted to discuss some other aspects that are dealt with in the Grand Challenge on Extremes. Um, so, oh, it's working now. Yeah, so I, I want to start with those pictures of uh, recent extreme events that uh, happened in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we know we already have uh, one degree of global warming. And this is showing that now at one degree of global warming, climate change is really happening. And we also having very uh, large uh, extreme events associated with that. So just uh, to provide a few examples, in 2018, in the summer, there were uh, concurrent extreme events in Europe, Asia, and North America. I included a few pictures, for instance, from Sweden, uh, Japan, um, California, and Canada. Uh, there were many deaths actually in Japan and Canada because of those heat waves. Uh, the year afterwards, uh, in 2019, there were again many uh, heat waves, and particularly uh, in France, uh, for the first time, 46 degrees was reached in that country. And uh, just as another example, in the Bahamas, there was a very strong uh, tropical cyclone Dorian, which was associated with very heavy precipitation event. So the likelihood of these events, either their occurrence or their intensity, obviously for tropical cyclones, is rather the intensity, was increased by human-induced climate change. We know that you know, uh, events of this intensity with this type of impacts are made more probable by climate change. Uh, and just to take one more example that happened since uh, last AGU meeting is uh, obviously the Australia fire uh, in 2019, 2020, so December and uh, January. This was, of course, a dramatic event. Everybody still remembers this. And it's important to put this into context. So the temperatures prior to the event and during the event were anomalously high. They were made at least 20 times more likely by observed warming since 1900. These were first estimates from Gertian von Aldeborg. I include here a tweet from him. So we know that one element that led to those fires, the temperature is very clearly related to human-induced uh, climate change. Uh, I think one point I want to highlight there, and I will mention this again at the end of the presentation, is the fact that you don't only have changing climate which lead to impacts, but those impacts in turn can also affect climate. Uh, so, for instance, the fires in Australia release about as much CO2 as the country's yearly emissions. This is really dramatic because you realize and that you have first impact, but then in turn this can also lead to enhanced climate change. So the outline of my presentation is first that I want to discuss in which way do change in extremes differ from changes in means. Uh, and then uh, I will discuss how did extreme change in the past and also how they projected to change uh, at 1.5 degree versus 2 degree of global warming. Uh, then I want to discuss briefly uh, the issue of compound events or multivariate dimension of extremes. 
finally, I will discuss very briefly what we have in terms of observations for extremes, both from ground observations and satellites. So regarding changes in extremes versus means, uh, this is of course a topic that has been addressed in many past papers and also past IPCC reports. Uh, so independently of any changes in the distribution of variables, if you have change in uh, means, this obviously leads to very, uh, a large increase in extremes and actually a stronger uh, increase in extreme in terms of frequencies and uh, the occurrence of uh, uh, less intense events. Nonetheless, uh, extremes can also respond differently from variable means. So you can also have some changes in the climate system, which affect specifically climate extremes. And I also wanted to highlight that. And uh, I included this illustration there to, to show why this is relevant. Uh, so obviously when we speak of climate change, we think of uh, load dice, so we start from normal dice. And in the first case, you would say, okay, all phase of the dice are you know, increased by, for instance, one, which at least one of the two dice, and this leads to a higher probability of extremes by the combination of the two. But what we're speaking of is uh, that in some cases, you could have some phases of the dice uh, that are more strongly increase in others, for instance, this is six, uh, is not transformed into a seven, but into an eight. And this is obviously particularly critical if you are interested in changes in extremes. So why can extreme uh, respond differently from the means? Uh, I just include here a few examples. You can have an enzyme warming under dry soil conditions. This is due to some moisture temperature feedbacks. You can have an enhanced warming resulting from snow melt through snow albedo temperature feedbacks. Uh, and you can also, of course, have heavy precipitation, increasing more than mean precipitation because it's more strongly tied to atmospheric moisture content and air temperature. Just to show some example where we really see this discrepancy between changes in extremes and changes in mean climate, um, this was a small comment we wrote with uh, colleagues during the so-called hiatus. Of course, we know there was no hiatus in global warming. Uh, this the warming since then has increased very much. The interesting point was the mean uh, temperature on Earth for a few years was warming a bit less than usual. But if you, there was a lot of papers obviously on this, but if you had looked at climate extremes, temperature extremes on that actually were increasing very much. That's what you see in this red line. So actually during this so-called hiatus period, temperature extremes warm much more than the global mean temperature. So again, this is whole discussion was really not relevant for changes in extremes on land. The fact that extremes respond differently from mean uh, is also shown in the projections. This is an analysis showing changes in the warmest day of the year in the Mediterranean region as a function of global warming. Uh, if the extremes were warming in the same amount as uh, mean global temperature, the, the red lines and blue lines would be on the dashboard black line, but you see that above it, it's because the warming, uh, regional warming, particularly the warming of extremes is higher. So we see the stronger warming of extremes in land hotspots versus the global temperature, which means that when we speak of 1.5 degree of global warming, this means actually much more warming in many regions, it's particularly for extremes. So this is what is shown here in this uh, picture. Uh, this is showing maps of uh, changes in uh, two types of extremes. On the one hand, the hot extremes, so the hottest day of the year is on the left. On the right, the coldest nights of the, day of the year. And you see what is the mean change uh, on lo locally, uh, when on average you have a mean global warming uh, of 1.5 degree. And what you see is many regions feel very much more uh, warming for those extremes. So for instance, on the left, uh, you have up to about a doubling of the warming for the hot extremes in many locations, for instance, in Europe or North America. And for the cold extremes, actually, we have up to a tripling of the response in the mid to high latitude regions. So certainly we have a stronger warming of that extremes compared to global mean temperatures. Uh, another point that is important is that you have this additional warming, but uh, this regional response in some case cannot be also associated with a uh, substantial interim model spread. That's what you see here based on semi-5 simulation for Central Europe. You see that at 1.5 degree of global warming, uh, 
in Central Europe, some models simulate about uh, one degree of warming and some others simulate five degrees uh, of warming. Uh, I call this uh, regional climate sensitivity because it shows that uh, this regional response is a, a response by itself that is separate from the global warming response and actually we find that it is different in different models. And this uh, regional climate sensitivity to distinguish it from the global climate sensitivity is actually the factors that contribute a lot to intermodel spread and on regional scale many regions actually more to uh, uncertainty between models and the global the uncertainty in global climate sensitivity and we have a paper in review on this topic right now just to show how you can use this regional climate sensitivity to reduce uncertainty to the study from Martha Fogel which we looked at specifically this region central Europe where we had such a large spread uh, if you look at the different simulations, uh, you see that there is a more or less three model distribution of the models with some models that are relatively wet. They don't show really much uh, decrease in precipitation. Some are dry, they show some decrease in precipitation and some are very dry, they show very strong decrease in precipitation. And most models that are uh, very dry are those that really show the strongest warming. So it's a uh, clear uh, link between the two. Now, using observation in present climate, you can look at which models seem more realistic and find that actually the very dry models don't seem uh, very realistic. And so this can be used as a constraint which reduce the spread uh, of projections. Obviously, uh, this means process representation is important. Uh, uh, another aspect that is important besides, uh, for instance, land surface process is obviously also model resolution which can be uh, critical for the represent representation of heavy precipitation, but I won't have time to discuss this in detail. So I will focus really on the land processes and land forcings. And uh, land forcings can affect extremely differently from means through different means. And I will provide a few examples, first through albedo. So if you have a higher albedo, uh, you have a stronger cooling during heat wave. So as an example is uh, in this picture, uh, basically a uh, cropland versus uh, tilled soil and if you have a higher albedo during heat uh, days uh, this will lead to a stronger cooling because this means more radiation is reflected so it means this albedo effect is stronger during hot days and during normal uh, days irrigation also leads to a stronger cooling of hot extremes compared to mean temperature because it counteracts soil drying during hot extremes which is one factor leading to strong temperatures Finally, deforestation. Uh, we found that in mid altitude deforestation has led to a stronger heating of hot extremes due to a lack of evapotranspiration in summer. So to focus on this process dimension, obviously statistics is essential to study extremes, but it's not sufficient. It's really important to consider the process dimension, the fact that you have non-stationarity and the existence of specific processes which affect extremes rather than means. Uh, and it's uh, for this reason, really, I think for uh, one aspect that should uh, receive more attention is uh, to better quantify the contribution of single forces, single, single process change to extremes, uh, which can help develop more accurate causal and statistical models for extremes. I'll just uh, show one example of a recent study led by Catherine Verley, uh, in which she looked at the disentangling of the contribution of thermodynamic versus dynamic processes to recent heat wave. What she did was to run simulations which prescribe part of the climate system. Uh, either they were fully interactive or they had uh, nudged atmospheric circulation or nudged soil moisture or uh, fully nudged both soil moisture and circulation. From this, we could uh, evaluate what was the contribution of these different processes to the hot extremes. And interestingly, uh, the result shows that uh, both atmospheric circulation and soil moisture have a similar contribution to this uh, hot extreme event, uh, so about 20 to 70 percent. I don't have time to discuss this in detail, but I think looking at this in more detail will help better understand uh, again what are the processes leading to these extreme events and also how we can better simulate them in models. So how did extreme change in the past? How has it projected to change in 1.5 versus 2 degree of global warming? To summarize, uh, the main conclusion of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree on which I was, uh, in which I was involved 
uh, there are detectable changes in climate which are attributable to human CO2 emissions, which means that it's mostly due to consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, for instance, increases in heat waves and hot extremes in most land regions, increases in heavy precipitation at global scale, increase in drought tendencies in some regions, and also more intense precipitation associated with tropical cyclone. Um, we have uh, more robust evidence compared to AR5 and also numerous studies for attribution of single events. It's currently being assessed in AR6. Uh, Xubin Zhang and myself are coordinating the chapter in AR6, which is uh, assessing the evidence on changes in climate extremes. So on the question of whether extremes at 1.5 degree versus 2 degree of global warming are substantially different, to summarize this very quickly, the answer is yes, there are substantial differences. It does make a difference if we manage to stabilize temperature at 1.5 degree of global warming. Uh, this is an analysis on the bottom for different uh, all of the regions shown uh, above. And whether, wherever you have some color, red or blue, it means that the difference is statistically significant. And you see for temperature extremes, uh, they are statistically significant in all regions. And for heavy precipitation, there are many regions which show statistically significant increase between 1.5 degree and 2 degree. Uh, CDD is consecutive dry days. Uh, there is an increase uh, in the number of consecutive dry days in some regions. Uh, between 1.5 degree and 2 degree, for instance, in the Mediterranean region or Southern Africa. So again, uh, we see that a limitation of global warming to 1.5 degree compared to 2 degree allows to avoid substantial additional changes in extremes and impacts, further increase in hot extremes in most inhabited regions of the world, heavier precipitation in several regions, increased drying in some regions, for instance, the Mediterranean and Southern Africa, and irreversible impacts, such as an increase of sea level rise, extension of some animal and plant species, in particular coral reefs. Uh, so one important figure from that report was this figure looking at changes in impacts and risk for different systems. Uh, whenever you get into red, this means that you have high risk, purple means you have very high risk. Um, so basically, for many systems, we see very high risk already actually above one degree and even more above 1.5. For instance, if you look at warm water corals, we're already getting into the zone with very high risk. And again, without going into the details, obviously many of these impacts are related to extreme events. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that many impact models actually are driven rather by a mean change in climate rather than extreme change in climate and possibly uh, some results could be different to see a uh, better representation of extreme events. So one topic I wanted to mention, uh, which is emerging, is the question of compound events. So it's basically looking at multivariate extremes. So in the literature in the past, we look, tend to look at heat waves and then droughts or heavy precipitation. We didn't look at uh, the extent to which those events are occurring, for instance, concurrently in the same place, or they or they would also occur concurrently at different location, but leading to correlated impacts. Uh, and this is uh, very important for different uh, reasons. Uh, one reason is that, for instance, if they are correlated, uh, correlations between extremes, uh, this means that they would happen more frequently than expected by chance. So, uh, for instance, it's uh, now well uh, proven that a dry condition and hot condition tend to happen together and actually they also enhance one another. And it means that uh, those uh, concurrent dry and hot conditions, which for instance can lead to higher fire risk, they will tend to occur more frequently than what you would expect from the separate uh, probability of dry versus hot events. Uh, same thing uh, for the range of extremes which are all basically affected by climate change. If you think of coastal inundation, on the global warming, global warming increased sea level rise, but it also leads to heavier precipitation, and those two together will lead to more risk of uh, coastal inundation. Uh, compound events start to be uh, considered also in IPCC report. For instance, in the special report on land, there was an assessment of changes in wildfire damage, also food supply instabilities, and uh, this obviously shows that already around 1.5 or 2 degrees, we get into very high to very high risk in both of those. I wanted to show some results from one study, 
uh, which we looked at concurrent extremes at multiple locations during the 2018 summer. I mentioned this at the beginning, there was this uh, heat waves and also in part uh, droughts in many locations. Uh, so we looked here at the risk of those concurrent heat waves at all those different locations in Europe, North America and Asia. Uh, so you see all the different events that occurred and also what impacts they had is on heat stroke fires, ecological damage, uh, damage of infrastructure or power production. Um, so in this study also led by Martha Fogel, uh, she looked at what was the probability of this event in historical data. And so historical data shows that this uh, event certainly was unprecedented. Uh, this is the case in observation and it's also the case and semi-5 simulation. Now, if you look at simulations that include uh, climate change, and if you focus at different levels of global warming, for instance, one degree, 1.5 degree or two degree, you find that, for instance, for one degree, which is climate as we experience it now, actually this event was rather probably that one out of six chance of happening problem is that the climate we're experiencing now is not the climate that we have seen in the past. It's actually the climate that is associated with one degree of global warming. And this type of event, so having such a large fraction of the area, which is about 22%, affected concurrently by hot extremes. At 1.5 degree, it would happen two out of three years. And at two degree of global warming, it would happen every year. And so maybe just a few conclusions from this. First, we see that we need to adapt to one degree of climate conditions. Just looking at what happened in the past is no longer a useful guide to the future. And finally, we see also the risk of concurrent extremes across regions could disrupt support chain. If you're saying that such event will happen every year and every year, many locations across different continents, you have massive extreme events happening. When you see what is happening this year, you can also imagine again what would be the possible impact, for instance, on food production. I've finished with observations for extreme. What do we have that can help us constrain models? Which is, there is a bit of uh, improvement. Uh, this is, these two pictures are from the HADEX3 database. We have a better coverage compared to the past, but obviously we have still many data gaps, for instance, in Africa or South America, or even in Asia. And I would say certainly this is something that community should be aware of. We need to improve this if we want to improve our models. And it's even worse for, this is, you see this for temperature and heavy precipitation, but it's even more difficult for subtly extremes or localized phenomena or drought-related variables such as soil moisture. Uh, and in that case, I, I refer to a presentation from Lisa Alexander at the forum meeting. Uh, we have also, um, a special issue that we have coordinated with uh, Lisa Alexander, Remy Koroga, and Andreas Becker, uh, in which we looked at the possible use of satellite observation for extremes. And I think that could be interesting for many of you. So before I come to the conclusions, I added this one slide, which is kind of postscriptum uh, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. What can we learn from this? To which extent is this relevant for climate change? I think what we can learn from the present crisis is that our globalized society is vulnerable. That's what we have seen. To some extent, local and regional risk have been decreased because we often can get some support from uh, surrounding regions. But the whole society could crumble if supply chains on a global scale are disrupted. In, in the COVID-19 uh, crisis, it's maybe the mask or medical instrument. But you could imagine with climate change, for instance, food supply chains could be disrupted. And also the worst case scenarios can happen. Uh, I think epidemiologists have said that the pandemic would be possible, uh, but of course people would prefer not to believe that. And sometimes maybe we have a false sense of security and, and this false sense of security and also the lack of resilience does not help. And this also applies to the climate crisis. Uh, can we learn from this crisis? I hope so. And maybe it could serve as an accelerator of change. We also discussed this a few people before the start of this webinar. Maybe it could foster virtual exchange instead of in-person meeting. That could be the case within IPCC, EU, but also AGU can think about virtual forms of conferences. I think this would be extremely valuable. And finally, I think health and safety come first. Uh, economy without health and with humans does not work and is meaningless. Maybe that's something that should also apply to climate impacts. 
And to speak about a possible worst case scenario, and I really want to highlight this additional study, which I think is the one point that makes me most concerned. This study uh, we published in 2018, we found a global scale relationship between droughts and CO2 increase from year to year. Uh, this is from two data sets that are fully independent, the GRACE measurements of water storage and CO2 measurements. So we find they are very strongly related, suggests that when you have drought, plants can take up less CO2 bit because uh, they, have, uh, they are challenged by the dry condition, also because, for instance, they are fires. But what we found was uh, that this correlation, which you see here on the right, uh, is very strong, it's 0.8. It's actually not represented in current state-of-the-art models. So trendy models and land modules that are using state-of-the-art system models don't capture this relationship, they're underestimated. This might mean potential for strong implication of global warming under higher CO2 concentration if we have more drought. And this potential change uh, is probably then not, not captured by models. I think we should be concerned about this and look into this better. So I come to conclusions. Uh, when we are looking at extremes, the process dimension is essential in addition to statistics to correctly assess extreme events, probabilities and change under enhanced global warming because some changes uh, are really tied to those changes in processes. At one degree, we are already facing several extreme events that would not have occurred without human influence on climate and limiting global warming to 1.5 degree avoids further increase in extremes compared to 2 degrees. And finally, some risks associated with extreme events are not yet well assessed. I think that's particularly the case for compound extreme events, including the co-occurrence of extreme events at several locations, such as the cross spread basket, and also, for instance, global drought effects on the carbon cycle. And that will be the end of my presentation. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Sonia. Appreciate that very much. Uh, I do have a couple of questions that have already come through for you, so I'll go ahead and ask those. Uh, again, you have the option, everybody, to use your hand raise functionality or to go ahead and ask your question through the chat. Uh, so the question that's come in from Gabby, uh, how can mm -hmm. we advance our knowledge from regional to local, urban scale, to understand the extremes there? What would be the main challenges to tackle? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh... So, I mean, obviously, it is very, very, very important question. There are already people doing research on this topic, uh, doing urban modeling, for instance. Uh, there are some observations of urban climate. I would say some of the challenges there are also in terms of climate adaptation. So, for instance, what is the impact of trees in uh, cities or increasing uh, reflectivity? Um, so I would say the, the main challenge and maybe having a bit more observation to improve our models and obviously also being able to run models at this high resolution over longer time periods. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for the question, Gabby. Uh, from Deep D, uh, could you please talk a little bit more about the mechanisms that could lead to concurrent extremes in different regions? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, I think that's actually mostly uh, statistics so to some extent because you have a mean global warming it means that each location you have a higher probability of having warmer conditions so um, there is a lot of discussion about the uh, wave patterns and huh? maybe if you have a uh, wave five, five, five uh, conditions or wave seven conditions that are more frequent uh, i think some data shows that those type of circulation patterns also happen in the past but uh, I think we, it's just, we are just paying more attention to this type of anomalous atmospheric circulation patterns because now under those circulation patterns we have a stronger warming from the surface in all of those different continents. Uh, so in the end it's, it's rich, there's a background warming and under specific conditions, specific atmospheric circulation you can have uh, basically concurrent occurrence of this extreme across those regions but I would say the main issue is in the end is thermodynamics. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for the question, Deepti. Um, how do, this is from Fu, how do the compound events affect the carbon fluxes? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, obviously, if you are looking at impact for plants, um, 
this can be quite relevant because it could uh, contribute to uh, you know more more impacts on plants or more mortality uh, if uh, for instance plants are affected for instance the same year by drought and then heavy precipitation so i would say this is certainly relevant uh, and specifically, obviously, just the, the compound dry and hot conditions are very relevant for plants because they lead to more risk of fires. So I would say that's the main points I would see there. Uh, so it looks like there's a follow up to that. How do we distinguish the effects of the compound events? Mm, uh, I'm not sure I understand this question. How do we distinguish the effects from, from those of single events or? um i don't know Fu. if you'd like i can unmute you and you can ask your question on the mic and maybe provide clarity um around that um actually it looks like Fu might have signed off <laughs> okay um uh, let's see well oh, no Fu is, is here let's see Fu. i'm gonna attempt to unmute you um let's see if you can ask your question on your microphone Fu, go ahead and ask your question uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. welcome. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, how, how can we distinguish the effects of the compound effects from the single single events, like a drought or... Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think from the analysis, what you can do is you look at impacts when you have only one of the two events versus when both of them are happening. Now, obviously, in the case, for instance, of drought and heat waves, they, they would often happen concurrently. So you might not have too many cases where you only have one, but it still happened. I would say if I take Europe, we do have some summers which are primarily, you know, affected by a drought or primarily by a heat wave, and then those that were pretty both hot and dry. So so basically the idea is really to to look at the data in bins and separate those different type of uh, occurrences. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Fu. Appreciate it. It looks like oh, we have one more question uh, from Nadine. How much do we know about extreme air pollution events? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, these are, this is an important topic. It's a topic on which I'm do, say, doing less uh, research. And I would say also within the Grand Challenge, maybe we have looked at lessons. This. It's an interesting question. Uh, especially in terms of compound events. So you do have compound effects uh, that um, include uh, aspects related to air quality. So for instance, when you have uh, heat waves, you might, might also have more ozone pollution. And those together, for instance, lead to uh, plant impacts and also to health impacts. So um, certainly extreme air quality uh, or air pollution events can, can be very relevant. And I would say maybe this is one topic which would need a bit more investigation. I say single extreme investigated, but look against these connections in the compound dimension would be interesting. Great. Thanks for that, Sonia. Thank you for that question, Nadine. So that's all we have time for right now. I want to thank both presenters, Susan Vandenhever and Sonia Senevaratni. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, especially right now. I think these webinars are great for our members and for the members of the section. Um, so thank you so much for that. I do want to just go ahead and also thank Jim Hurel, who is the president of Atmospheric Sciences section, and Paul Newman, who is the president-elect, uh, for their energies around this and for bringing this to the members. The idea of sort of repurposing some of this amazing contact and uh, content and great presenters from the fall meeting, giving an opportunity to share this with members that may not have had a chance to see that session or not attend the meeting. And of course, we will record these so we'll be able to view archive versions of these um, in perpetuity. So um, thank you again to Jim and Paul and our speakers and for everyone that joined today. Uh, ways you can engage with us we are trying to do more for our members during this difficult time and providing resources for virtual learning and virtual collaboration so take a look at some of that we've sent out some messages around that uh, always happy to help our members when we can that's what we're here for uh, we'll be doing more of these the next uh, webinar will be next tuesday at this uh, same time 12 p.m eastern daylight time uh, also 
if that time doesn't work for you, we of course will be recording and archiving it. But uh, Christy Varing from um, uh, will be talking to us on atmospheric chemistry and climate on a changing Earth. So definitely check. And with that, I say thank you so much for joining us. And please, everybody, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.